Good afternoon from beautiful Honolulu. This is Think Tech Hawaii, Code Green. Do we have some distinguished guests with us today or what? We have Paul Bernstein and Ashley Boggs of the Citizens Climate Lobby. And actually, Paul wears uh, several other hats as research associate with you heroes, so forth, so forth. Too long to list. As we're all aware, Hawaii is, was the first state in the nation to declare the goal of 100% clean energy by the year 2045. We've extended that to go carbon-free not long after that. Pretty ambitious goals, and we couldn't do it without a host of experts in many, many fields, and we have two such experts with us today. They deal primarily in the area of uh, policy research and some activism. So, Paul, take it away, introduce your organization, and let's get started. Uh, mahalo, Howard, for inviting us onto your show. Ashley and I are ex very excited to be here. Um, so CCL is concerned with climate change and energy issues, and I would say very concerned with expenditures on energy as they contribute to the high cost of living in Hawaii. Um, we look forward to a conversation about how to lower these costs through individual actions, changes in energy procurement, and government actions. Um, I'll let Ashley take it away and provide more of a background of, of CCL. Hi, everyone. Um, if we could go to the first slide of the presentation, uh, just a quick intro. Citizens Climate Lobby is a nonpartisan, nonprofit, grassroots advocacy organization that Paul and I are a part of. Uh, we are a global organization with a big focus in the U.S. Um, and a strong chapter here in Hawaii. Um, our main goal is to build the political will for a livable world. Um, we have a variety of policy focuses, uh, primarily national carbon fee and dividend, building electrification and efficiency, permitting reform, and some nature-based solutions like you know, our native forestry and wetlands. Uh, if we go to the next slide really quickly, how do we build a, the political will for a livable world? Uh, this is where I really love Citizens Climate Lobby. We help you build the skills to communicate to your uh, representatives and senators, both at a federal and state level. Um, we often hear that climate is not a topic being brought up by constituents. Um, the senators and representatives need to hear that climate is a priority. And we're not, you know, we're not dumb. We know that it's not maybe your number one priority, and that's totally okay. Um, housing is essential. Being able to provide, pay for your electric bill is essential. But climate, uh, pro-climate policies and affordability can actually go hand in hand. So that's what we'll talk about today, how you can be pro-climate and uh, pro-housing, that's uh, totally complementary, and we can all work together towards this new future. Um, and hopefully with Citizens Climate Lobby, you can help build some skills. Um, how do you effectively communicate to your legislators um, over time? So that's our, our intro for Citizens Climate Lobby, and I'll hand it over to Paul for some of the first um, topics. So um, one of the first areas is what individuals can do to reduce their own home energy use. So there's um, various uh, programs out there, um, thanks to um, the Inflation Reduction Act, and actions taken within our own state here. Um, so whether it's installing uh, solar hot water heating, um, rooftop photovoltaic, um, bringing in an electric vehicle. So for example, uh, Hawaii Energy um, offers subsidies such that if you install hot, solar hot water heating, they estimate that the savings, your energy savings over time can be about $1,000 a year for 15 years. So getting back to Ashley's point that there are policies here that are in place that will both reduce your energy costs, making life more affordable, while also being good for the climate. Uh, Paul, um, Paul, let, let me uh, do a little interruption because you guys are too young, but I go back to the day when most single family homes were not air conditioned. They didn't have a whole bunch of electronic gadgets in them. And the typical residential bill 
was about a thousand kilowatt hours a month, we made a huge push against you. You guys were still in kindergarten at this time. This was the uh, 1980s, and a huge push towards solar water heating. The average bill of those people who did put solar water heating in was reduced from a thousand kilowatt hours a month to 600 kilowatt hours a month because resistance water heating is extremely inefficient and that was by far the main energy consumer in the home boom solar water heating comes in boom these people have a lot more dollars in their pocket and we were able to reduce the fossil fuel use that went into heating that water so just a brief interruption historic historic reference no appreciate <laughs> appreciate that um and along those lines right okay. also various uh, energy efficiency programs, right? So bringing in more efficient refrigerators, air conditioning systems, heat pumps, what have you, right? So there are monies, government um, has helped with this, making subsidies available and also um, introducing or implementing efficiency standards. Something that by the way, is before our state legislature and hopefully we'll, um, be approved to extend the state's energy efficiency programs. And as you pointed out, Howard and Ashley said, these really do go hand in hand, lowering the costs in the long run, um, as well as being good for our environment. Why don't I also go on from here? Let me talk about the, to the next slide. So the other part of this is, you know, you can, one can reduce their own intake of, of energy through, as we said, energy efficiency standards um, or making things more energy efficient. But also we could work to lower just the overall cost of energy. And what we see here is if we compare KIUC's electricity costs to those of HECO over the last couple of years, KIUC's electricity costs are actually lower than those of HECO. Um, they're also more stable and this is attributed to their um, faster transition towards renewable energy. So um, also again, this nice complementarity here, we have lower emissions, lower dependence on fossil fuels, coupled with lower energy prices and more stable energy prices, which is also important to affordability. So it's not necessarily just the average energy prices, right? On people on lower income, if they're hit all of a sudden with a surprise high energy bill, it can make life very difficult in that one individual month. So having prices or costs that you can easily budget for makes life much more much more certain and, and stable. So to help with this, again, like the previous, um, there is a role for government here. Um, whether it's permitting reform to help HECO be able to install or build more renewable energy faster, um, work with communities to compensate them to, to build the renewables there. Um, and also, I would argue for Hawaii, there's an issue around funding geothermal or funding the research into geothermal, since that resource seems to be plentiful throughout the islands or has the potential to be plentiful throughout the islands. Let me uh, just interject re regarding geothermal. I'm an amateur historian. And in 1787, a French sea captain named uh, La Perouse, La Perouse, anchored off of the south coast of Maui. And when, after the sunset, he and his crew were looking at this huge mountain, Haleakala, and there were these strange red strips on the side of the mountain. Those, that was the last lava flow to come out of Haleakala. 18 or 1787, that's a blip of an eye geologically. So I keep wondering why we just don't drill down in that. Oh, and speaking of which, a lot of people enjoy La Perouse Bay to this day. I don't know why we just don't drill down and look like heck for uh, a nice source of heat there. Completely with you. <laughs> you know, that I mean, right? I think that's pretty well known, just exactly what you're saying, right? The, the hot spot runs. Uh, very close to Maui, and as you said, um, would seem a good idea to explore 
the potential for that resource there. I'll turn over the presentation now to, to Ashley to do the, the next slide. Sounds good. Um, Cruise Bay is probably one of my favorite snorkeling spots here um, on Maui. So I live on Maui. I forgot to mention that. Um, yeah. So the next um, topic that we have is about better land use, reducing energy costs. So um, housing is such a big issue here on Hawaii. And uh, there's many ways to make it more affordable and um, lower carbon emissions. So increasing density of housing stock is one of those ways. Uh, when you share infrastructure, um, that's less you have to build, less you have to ship over to implement. And multiplexes are generally higher energy efficiency than single family units. Um, I know we all would love to all live in single family homes, but there is a place there for that kind of missing middle um, starter homes, for example. Um, as a renter, I'd love to have, you know, a multiplex or some sort of shared living um, area. Uh, it's also important to build in the urban corridor. So especially I know Paul's on Oahu, um, reducing transportation energy, making sure people are using mass transit or other forms of uh, transit. And um, in this, the, the role of the government is really big here, I believe. So on Maui, some of the uh, zoning regulations are from the 60s. Uh, that's when we thought, you know, suburban, amazing life. And now we know there's a balance there. You know, you do want Suburbia, but there are also plenty of people who want to live in denser housing, um, able to access all the things they need quickly. Um, so city zoning is important there. I know Paul has some insights on Oahu as well, um, as well as building codes allowing us to build this type of housing. I um, completely agree. I mean, we've been facing this issue, again, many bills before the current legislature to, to help with this, both um, if we could increase the housing stock, that would presumably make housing more affordable, right? Since it seems basic supply and demand issue. Um, and just as Ashley said, if we could build in the, the main corridor here, it would just make um, public, public transportation just that much more cost effective. Um, you know, it would boost ridership presumably and leading to this positive cycle, if you will, for using mass transit versus what we have today. Yeah, we, uh, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Singapore Stan that uh, refers to Senator Stanley Chang of our legislature, and he has spent time in Singapore, which is about the size of Molokai. Molokai has 7,000 people. Singapore has something like 4 million people. And the way they get around there is by extensive subways. And I haven't been there recently, but I assume they're the same as Hong Kong. You go into a convenience store and you have a transportation card and you hand it to the clerk and he gives you $25 worth of transportation. You hop into the subway, beep, you're on your way. Then you get out and you go to a bus, beep, if there's... Uh, a ferry available, you hop from the bus to the ferry, beep. And then when your balance gets low, you go to a convenience store again and you fill some more uh, cash up with it, making public transportation really, really affordable and really, really uh, effective. And of course, that, that's the ideal. And especially Honolulu is just a wee bit behind on that. So, so, although Frank Fossey did create the bus for us many, many years ago. Right. I mean, just as you pointed out, Howard, right, if we, you know, the more dense an area, right, the the better the mass transit can be. It can be much more cost effective for the city, right, rather than running buses that take five people or what have you. Yeah. Many years ago, I'm, I'm the energy codes person and I chair the What You Building Code Council. And we worked with each county to permit ADUs, accessory dwelling units, these smaller units in people's backyards, either attached to the main house or separate from the main house. So that, that goes a long way towards the type of infilling that, that you've been describing here. Right. And I guess also just um, with the city zoning, if you could look at changing some of the R10 to R5, in other words, you know, which is basically, I think, what you're saying, right? That um, zones where only one house can build per 10,000 square feet, 
change it that you know one house per five thousand square feet or mm -hmm. something similar or as ashley was mentioning allowing duplexes or multiplexes i want to acknowledge you know many of the islands you do have to travel far so this won't work for every single part of every island uh, but there are definitely areas where we could build more dense housing um, and build up more mass transit options or alternative transit so just something to consider we can we can have um, we can kind of have both you know you can continue mm -hmm. to build single family homes as well as build this uh, denser housing which is better for the carbon emissions standpoint and a whole lot cheaper also right yes Right, and to the carbon emissions, right, just lower energy use generally with a smaller footprint of a house and what have you is, mm -hmm. you know, studies are pretty conclusive on, on that, right, that generally the quadplexes or whatever per household energy use is far smaller than that of a single family home. So, again, helping with the affordability. If we can go to the, the next slide, I think Ashley and I will kind of tag team on this since um, this is uh ccl has been ccl's um primary or, or number one focus so basically there's a there's a policy out there that can help or complement the various initiatives or actions that are being taken now whether it's um energy efficiency um also argue for helping people you know incentivizing making the footprint of a building smaller in terms of um, energy use um, and the advantage of this policy is it also works to help people on the lower income side make the energy transition so the policies um, there's sort of a, a national level and a state level policy um, very similar the idea is to place a fee on fossil fuels and for the government to collect those revenues and then to take those revenues and give them back to people in equal shares. And so if you do this at the, the federal level, um, it's called carbon fee and dividend. Doing it at the state level, it's referred to as carbon cashback. So bills have been proposed both at the federal level, at the federal level, in fact, one is um, there right now in the House of Representatives, um, as well as ones being proposed in the state. Most recently, there was a, a carbon cashback bill that didn't make it out of EET, unfortunately, but um, before there, that would charge a fee on the import of fossil fuels. The state government would collect the revenues and give the revenues back to um, people of Hawaii in equal shares. and. The bill is progressive or help, well, it's progressive and therefore helps lower and middle income households because um, everybody's energy usage is different and generally higher income households use more energy and also the energy associated with goods and services is higher since they have more income, but everybody gets the same amount back. So whether you're low income or high income, you get the same amount but generally the higher income folks are paying more money. So this, this policy, as I said, um, by putting, uh, raising the price of fossil fuels makes it more likely that people will conserve energy or move to energy that is either more efficient or lower carbon emitting. So the advantage, um, the advantage there on the, the energy side, and then, as I said, making it more affordable for those that are most vulnerable in our community. And I, I would couple that with massive education, massive rebates and massive uh, tax credits. Right, so um, you could think of modifying the program the way it's been proposed so far, so that let's say the higher income folks, the top 20% um, receive no revenue back and use it as you're suggesting, Howard, right? use it for education, you could use it for rebates um, to help Hawaii Energy, for example, fund the Hawaii Energy Program to make rebates more accessible for lower income and middle income households to put in more energy efficient technologies, or maybe you could put it in for solar credits or, or what have you. But I, I guess I would argue or emphasize that a nice 
part of this program is it is revenue neutral. It doesn't actually cost the government money. So it'd be a way that the government could fund some of these subsidies without having to raise taxes or pull money away from programs that are helping low and middle income folks. So administratively, pretty straightforward. So there's not a lot of extra verification that's happening. It really is just an equal share to all residents. So once you start adding more details about, oh, this percentage should go here, that's a lot more administrative costs. And um, so that would require probably staffing and, uh, you know, a lot more work to make that happen. Yeah, I'm reminded that our tech, the federal tax code, I think is what, four inches thick or something like that. You don't, don't want to be replicating that. <laughs> I do want to say, I think we covered a lot of different policies. And I think one thing that I notice about you know, young people and people, my friends, that it's it's hard to get involved. You don't know all of the details about all these different policies, um, but you know you care about the climate. So making your voice heard about caring about the climate is the first step. And then you can learn about these different topics um, from the experts. So you go into all the building codes and city zoning, carbon fee and dividend and the tax code. Um, there are ways to get more educated, but it shouldn't prevent you from taking a first step, um, saying that you're you're caring about the climate and affordability. I think that's really important, Ashley, what you're saying, right? That there are many ways to get involved if you care about the climate, right? And that's part of why CCL broadened its um, list of priorities, right? From the last one that we talked about, carbon fee and dividend, to building electrification, making the homes more energy efficient, making buildings more energy efficient, to permitting reform, to helping enable you know, electric companies to put in more renewable energy, to connect up um, renewable energy resources, need transmission lines, what have you, um, and taking advantage of, of nature, right? Um, whether it's um, making the soil able to absorb more carbon, uh, to planting trees, uh, what have you, numerous other nature-based solutions. So exactly to your point, Ashley, there are many ways to get involved and we all need to do our part. Yeah, one of the efficiency measures that uh, we're pushing for, and this is aimed, well, we're hopefully about to receive lots and lots of federal dollars and to distribute uh, maybe to people like yourselves, uh, but, and we're directed at low income communities, first and foremost. And something that we have in mind at the Energy Office is going into those low income areas and ensuring that the roofs of the residences or the apartments or whatever are highly reflective so that instead of the sun's heat being absorbed and going into the living space, it reflects back and ditto with uh, walls. There's the Cool Roof Rating Council and the Cool Wall Rating Council working very, very uh, closely with them. And that's a, you have to coat your roofs and you, your walls with something. And you either pay a teeny little premium or no premium whatsoever above no, normal uh, coating on those surfaces. That's, that's a one instance of pa passive uh, design and low low cost, initial cost. And I'll think about the home as a system too. So what you're talking about is reflecting the heat off of the roof. You mm -hmm. know, you could have not done that and gotten a more efficient AC, but now your AC has to run more and more, like more hard. Um, so then if you're building your reflective roofing, then you don't need as much AC. So it all works mm -hmm. really holistically together. Um, it's just important to make some progress towards uh, more efficient energy use. And speaking of AC, we live in a mild climate. Some people talk about the heat. Well, go down to the Seychelles part of Africa and uh, talk about the heat. You're not going to get much sympathy uh, there. But what works elegantly in Hawaii is ceiling fans, which use one twentieth as much energy as the most efficient uh, split system, split uh, air conditioning systems. And something we're pushing for is there's a clamor to cool down our public school classrooms 
and it's ACAC. We don't have the money for any of that. Wood and ceiling fans keep the kids and the teachers uh, cool that way. Yeah, I guess just let it go back to the the building codes or what have you. That I think it, the importance of those and energy efficiency standards is it kind of corrects a market failure, right? Where the people who um, build the buildings just want to build it for the lowest cost, right? But once you take ownership of the building, you want the maintenance of the building, if you will, or the operation of the building to be the lowest cost, right? So the efficiency standards or the building codes can help us move that way. And many of those things, as you're pointing out, Howard, are pretty low cost, right? To make things either more efficient yep. or yep. select sunlight. Yeah, if, if you see any white hair around the edges here, that is due to that very, very uh, contentious issue. It's called split incentives. The builders are incented to do this, and the people who want to mitigate the heat gain are doing this. And we have just a few seconds left. Any final words of extreme wisdom? Hey, get involved. Get involved however you can, um, the more the merrier. Mm -hmm. Okay, on that very cheery note, we must bid fond adieu. Howard Wig, Code Green, thank you so much. Ashley Boggs and Paul Bernstein, we'll see you next time. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.